new to this because I've, I've been developing this workshop over the past six or seven years uh, is that uh, in the past one or two years I've been working on a tool that um, consolidates a lot of these attacks into one interface um, that's for Metasploit like um, so on the VM if you have it uh, you'll be able to bring up the slides um, if you just go to HTTP colon slash slash slides it, it's running on your VM there um, the challenges are um, HTTP colon slash slash uh, challenges um, so we're not going to cover all of these on here because these are it's kind of just these have been challenges I've been working on and um, I've been fine-tuning what I cover but um, you know you can also work on them in your own time if you like uh, but just to oh yeah I need to update this slide um, but um, just some logistics on it uh, so once you do get the VM up and running there's an account called workshop and the password is workshop um, and the you basically just need your browser and then uh, in the uh, the terminal uh, there's already uh, a tool that I call crypt display and uh, just to Activate it. Um, actually, how how clear is the uh, or how legible is the uh, the terminal here? Should I make it big? The text bigger? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's good. Okay. Um, so I don't know. If it's I don't know how to make this thing go away, but um, so the command I just wrote ran um, is uh, defend shell that just activates the virtual environment, um, and then. Um, the tool itself, you just run doing Python script display. Um, so we'll have this um, available for the, uh, the actual challenges. It's definitely a work in progress. Um, it's mostly like what I uh, work on when I have a spare half an hour, an hour. Um, so, uh, but I do hope that some point if if uh, people like it enough people contribute and can add more attacks but i'll describe a little bit more about the 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 emphasis of the tool um, as we go along okay um so just to get through some very basic um overview of what cryptography is um, so there's there are different uh, aspects of cryptography um, that we're going to talk about um, so the first is just your basic uh, symmetric key encryption. Um, so um, the basic idea is uh, sender and recipient want to uh, exchange data in a confidential way. They both share the same key. Uh, the sender will use that key to encrypt the message and the receiver using the, that same key can de decrypt that message. So in this uh, workshop, we're going to be mostly dealing with block ciphers. Um, so uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that in a, a moment. But basically, a block cipher is a, an encryption algorithm that requires that the message have a fixed size. It can't be any bigger, can't be any smaller. Uh, and it'll turn out that all the attacks dealing with block ciphers are just going to be on how you use the block cipher. It won't have anything to do with the algorithm itself. So whether you're using AES or DES or some future block cipher that is even more secure, uh, if you do it in the same way as 
these uh, that makes it vulnerable to these attacks, um, it won't matter at all. Okay, and then um, this is a little bit of a um, this doesn't quite cover all of the of uh, asymmetric encryption, but or asymmetric cryptography, but also known as public key cryptography. But the basic idea is that um, there are going to be two keys, a public key and a private key. And uh, in, in terms of asymmetric encryption, uh, the recipient is going to uh, distribute their public key to anybody who wants to send them a message. Then the sender will use that public key to encrypt it, um, send the ciphertext, and then only the recipient who uh, has the private key can decrypt it. Uh, we'll also be talking about an, another operation called uh, key signing, and this one kind of works in reverse. In this situation, uh, the person with the private key wants to demonstrate that a certain message came from them, and so they'll use their private key to add a tag to the message, and the public key will be used to verify that that message came from the person with the, the corresponding private key. So back to block ciphers. Um, as I mentioned, uh, block ciphers use a fixed size input and uh, they'll produce something that looks random. That's sort of the, the nature of cryptography. Um, and it will, but it will depend on the message and the key. Um, and the security of uh, the algorithm or the encryption will depend generally on the secrecy of the key, but we'll find that um, the way you use the block cipher can uh, still reveal the, uh, the, the original plain text. And uh, so um, what we're going to see is that there are a variety of block cipher modes, because as I mentioned before, that a block cipher requires a fixed input size and generally your messages aren't always going to be 16 bytes or whatever. So um, you're going to need a way to encrypt messages of different sizes. So how do we do that? Well, the first and most obvious way is called ECB mode, which stands for electronic code book. And so this, all it does is it breaks up your message into block size chunks. And then each uh, block of plain text gets encrypted with that same key and outputs the ciphertext. Uh, the advantage of this is it's highly parallelizable. Um, you can run the encryption algorithm on each block simultaneously um, for very fast encryption. Uh, similarly with decryption, you'll take you'll break up the ciphertext into blocks. You'll take each ciphertext, uh, use the key and the decryption algorithm, and pop out the plain text. Uh, again, highly parallelizable. You could you could, in principle, do the description of every single block simultaneously. But um, show of hands, how many people have seen this before? Yeah. Okay. So if you haven't seen this before, uh, it, you may hear in the future people talking about how ECB mode allows us to see penguins. So basically, what it's saying here is that there's a lot of redundancy in this image, right? There's a lot of white space, a lot of black, and then like the yellow here. Uh, so if you encrypt this image using ECB mode, like each block of white space is going to be the same. And even though that gets scrambled up, you'll still see that, okay, we got this white space here, we got some black, kind of white. It's a little bit fuzzy, but you can still see in the image here that we have a penguin. Uh, so uh, this leads to a number of issues. Okay. I should add a slide about this. <laughs> um, so the main problems with ECB mode are that, as you can see, um, repeated patterns in the plain text show up as repeated patterns in the ciphertext. So uh, this is something that we won't cover. I'm not going to really cover uh, in depth. ECB mode, mostly because 
Um, I think there are more interesting attacks so for the sake of time. Uh, want to cover those. Uh, ECB mode does show up in the real world, um, but um, it's it's still, I think, fairly rare. Uh, even in the in the work that I do, um, <laughs> I say this, uh, I don't see that often. I did actually just recently see ECB mode come up. Uh, I had to shake my head at it. Uh, and I think in that situation, they were encrypting one block of text with a unique key each time. Um, so it's not the worst application of ECB mode, but uh, you know it uh, it does allow you to, if you have some control over the input, you can use that to uh, recover the part of the plain text that you don't have control over. Um, and there's also what are called cut and paste attacks. So if you, I mean, we in this case we have a penguin, but we could, uh, in principle, take this encrypted penguin and cut it, paste it together in a different way. And uh, there'd be no way for the decryptor to tell the difference. Uh, so one of the uh, most common applications of this is you might imagine that somebody's trying to store, uh, instead of passing uh, like a query string parameter in a web request uh, in plain text, maybe they try to encrypt that whole thing and then they will uh, they will use the, the like sort of uh, what's the word uh, destructure it uh, after decrypting first. Uh, and if they use ECB mode, uh, you could rearrange the blocks so that it decrypts to something different. For example, if there was a a portion of it that was like admin equals false, if you have some control over the input. And can then restructure it. You can turn that into admin equals true, um, which will allow somebody to uh, perhaps turn on uh, admin privileges that they shouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, so generally, this is considered very bad. Most people know that. Um, so, as I said, it doesn't show up that often. Um, but this one still does. And so, um, I, in fact, I think this is the most. Probably the still the most common uh, block cipher mode that I see, um, and so uh, it's known as cipher block chaining or CBC mode for short. Um, and this tries to solve the the problem of the the repeated patterns by uh, first off, it adds a little bit of noise to the beginning. No, basically, it's going to add noise to each block of the plain text. So, in this situation, instead of just running the plain text through the encryption algorithm, we're going to start off with an initialization vector, which should just be a random set of bits. And then we're going to use the XOR function with the plain text. So, that's just going to, uh, for every bit that's a one here, it will flip the corresponding bit in the plain text. If there's a zero bit, it will leave the, that plain text bit alone uh, before encrypting it. So if this initialization vector is random, then uh, XORing with it will also make the input to the encryption algorithm random. Uh, and then we take the output and we use that as the IV for the next block. And so repeat, we XOR with that IV, uh, run it through the algorithm, take the ciphertext and uh, use as the ID for the next. So that's why it's called cipher block chaining. It's using the cipher text in a chain here to produce the, the final result. So as you can see, each to encrypt each block, it's dependent on the previous one. So we can parallelize it like we can with ECB mode, but it does help to prevent that uh, uh, those patterns that we saw in ECB mode. Um, and again, with decryption, it works. Similarly, here, so we again we start with the first ciphertext block, we decrypt it, and then we XOR it with the initialization vector uh, to get the plain text. Then we use that first ciphertext block as the ID for the next one, uh, take the second ciphertext block, decrypt, uh, XOR, and get the plain text, and so on and so forth. Um, so the initialization vector needs to be. Uh, known by the decryptor, um, but this is generally not a problem. Like it doesn't need to remain secret. It's just 
um, should be randomly generated at, at encryption time. Okay, so um, this is kind of a, a warm up exercise to um, get a, a feeling for what uh, can happen with CBC code. So uh, in this example here, this is kind of an older attack, um, but I don't, I don't think I've ever actually seen this in the in the wild um, myself, but I know it's something that has happened before. Um, so this, uh, oftentimes people will assume things that are, are required are too strong, uh, like, uh, you know, when it comes to the ID, I said, it should be random. Uh, people think maybe it also needs to remain secret. And so uh, since both the encryptor and decryptor need to know what the ID is, uh, but they both have to know the key anyway, uh, there was a thought that we'll make the, the key and the ID the same. Um, but it turns out that if you can get a decryption of a special ciphertext, uh, you can actually recover the IV, which in this case happens to be the key. And so the way this works is, uh, so if we have an existing ciphertext, uh, and we break it up into some number of blocks, and then we um, change it so that we send the first block, then a block of all zeros, and then the first block again, um, and we get that decryption, we will be able to recover the ID. And the reason for that is that um, when we see the decryption, what will happen is it will do, it'll take that first block, decrypt it, and uh, XOR with the ID. So we'll get the original plain text for that back. Then for the next block, this will be kind of garbage because it's going to decrypt the zero block. Uh, but we don't really care about that. But then since zero is going to be used as the IV again over here, where this third block is really the same as the first block, it's going to run it through the decryption, XOR with zero. But when you XOR with zero, you don't change it at all. So uh, here in these two blocks, we're going to get uh, the results of uh, this one's going to be the result of decrypting the ciphertext block uh, XOR the IV, and this is going to be the result of decrypting the ciphertext block, but without XORing the IV. And it turns out if you XOR these two things together, you'll that will cancel out the original plain text portion, and you'll get back the IV. Uh, so uh, I include in the slide deck like some examples that you can sort of work by hand. Uh, so uh, I don't really want to go through these during the class, but in your own time, if you want to check this, you can see um, that if you use AES and uh, use these keys, um, you'll see that this is the example ciphertext. Um, then if you were to decrypt this, uh, yeah, you'll get that and computing the XOR. Um, ooh, CSS is hard. <laughs> I need to fix that one. Um, oh, I think I forgot to mention this. Um, for those of you who have the VM, uh, something I, I did this time as well uh, is I, I put a cron job on the uh, account that, or no, it's a root job that will every hour on the hour, check the uh, Git repository that I have the challenges and the slides stored on, and it will try to pull, and if there are any updates, it will um, refresh the, the slides and the challenges. So um, any updates that I make fixes, like if I this evening decide to fix this, um, it will automatically update that for you. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, when we're doing block cipher challenges, it's um, we're, we happen to be using AES, which is 16 byte block. Um, so I only mentioned AES because it, it block size is 16 bytes, and that's what we're going to assume. But it doesn't really have anything to do with the fact that it's AES. It could be any other block cipher, uh, 16 bytes long. Um, and so we're always going to see these in a hex. So that turns out to be 32 characters. 
So I think I will do this one. I will go through the entire challenge here, but I'll just sort of demonstrate. Oh, I can. That's better. Okay, so in this challenge, um, if you click on that link, it sends you to this page where the ciphertext is in this query string parameter. And all the app does is it decrypts the message. And then um, I believe, if I remember correctly, it's just going to check to see if uh, it decrypts to something that's a printable string. Uh, but uh, here, I'll just show you what, uh, like, sort of the mechanics of how this works. And then, um, then I'll point out where you can finish the rest of the challenge here. So this is going to be one of the only ones where we're not going to actually use my tool for it, but um, I think it's, it's an illustrative example. So first, I'm going to copy that first block. So I just need to copy the first 32 uh, hex characters. All right, now that I've copied that, I'm going to put in a block of all zeros. That's 32 zeros. And I'm going to put another copy of the first block. So hopefully this works correctly. I did that right. Okay. So um, I wanted to demonstrate this just because this is an example of how this kind of block could show up in the real world if if they were really doing this. Um, as you can see, um, it was, uh, I mean, this is somewhat of a contrived example, but here it's trying to decode the hex string. Uh, and expecting it to be all printable, but it failed to do that. So what it did was actually just dump out the uh, the the hex of the decryption. Um, so for any of you those of you who are particularly good with ASCII, you might be able to tell uh, what the first bytes are. You know? um, but what you would do is, uh, you know, this might be, I used to have this um, separated by block to make it easy, but I was working on trying to change it so that I could actually have it run by my tool. Um, but for now, what you would have to do is um, sort of copy out the first 32 characters and then go another 32 characters in and then copy the next 32. So you want to the first chunk of 32 the 32 characters and the third chunk of 32 characters um, and then uh, for now i have on here actually uh, some helper tools for this so uh, what you would do is you would grab that first set of 32 characters put it in here take the second but it will calculate the xor and give it to you as hex and then uh, in the aes decryptor um, you put the IV and the key in the hex and the entire ciphertext, and it will decrypt it for you. So um, I just, you can find similar tools like this on the internet. Uh, I just kind of put this conveniently for you here, um, but we're not going to uh, go over that. We're not going to finish that today and try and get into some more interesting things. Are there any questions so far? I'm not going too fast right now. All right, so this is perhaps the first one that um, I still see often enough that it's gotten CVEs. Admittedly, I think at this point, the last one that I saw, um, and I may have, I mean, they just happened to cross my path. And there might be more recent ones, but um, there's a CV in 2016, I believe, there's an Apache one. Um, 
but this is a uh, going to be uh, CBD panning marbles. Anybody ever heard of panning marble tags? So this one's actually kind of a fun one. We will use the my tool for this one. Uh, okay, so uh, in the earlier section on block ciphers, we kind of glossed over a fact that uh, when I was saying like break up your message into block size chunks, that still assumed that your message was a multiple of a block size in in bytes. So um, you know, like in the case of AES assuming that your message would always be a multiple of 16 bytes. Uh, in reality, that doesn't usually happen. So to solve that problem, we usually use something called padding. Um, and there are different padding schemes. And depending on which padding scheme you use, it will affect how you would actually really run this attack. Uh, the most common uh, that I see outside of, there was a TLS, uh, or am I still an SSL, I forget, uh, bug that I'll mention later on. Um, it's used in different padding schemes. So the attack works a little bit differently than this, but this kind of still gives sort of flavor. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to use PKCS 7 padding. And the way that works is uh, this actually, this form of padding actually builds an, an integrity check. Um, it has at least, it's a small integrity check. It, it's, um, it only checks that um, the padding bytes themselves have been changed. Um, but basically what you do is you count how many bytes are needed to finish the block. So here in this example, um, I, these Ds are just supposed to be like random data bytes. I just think of it as like uh, you know, X or Y or something like that. It doesn't matter what those are. Um, but the data ends here. So there was a, a full block and then a remaining four bytes. So that leaves 12 bytes left. Um, so I put in hex. Uh, that works out to be 0C. And so PKCS7 padding says fill the block with how many bytes you put in there. So uh, each one's going to have the same value, it's going to be 0C 12 times. Um, and uh, we're going to exploit the fact that sometimes uh, when using PKCS7, or well, for that matter, any sort of padding and CPC mode, uh, after it decrypts, it's going to try to check that padding to see if it's valid or not. Um, so uh, what are we going to, how's the attack going to work? I mean, the first bit here is that um, because each ciphertext block acts as the initialization vector for the next block, uh, it turns out that you can use that to flip the bits that come out here. Um, so if you flip a bit in on this ciphertext block, it will change which bits get flipped here. So it will still it'll flip something in the, the plain text um, at the cost of completely ruining this. Yeah. So you know if I made one bit flip on this ciphertext and run it through here, it's going to come out to be complete garbage. Um, regardless of what happened over here, it's just the output from this one's going to be garbage. But I have control over what it's going to change over here, and we're going to use that to our advantage. So, um, what? How's the attack going to work? Uh, and actually, actually, before we get into the mechanics of the attack, what is the goal? What does this attack going to accomplish? So. In this case, what we're going to do is exploit um, whenever the decryptor tells us that we have a, whether we have a bad or a good or a bad pad, um, we're going to be use, use that information to decrypt the original message. We won't get the key, so we can only use, we'll only be able to decrypt that one message. If there was another message, we'd have to apply the attack again, but it, it does break the confidentiality for that message. So how does this work? Um, to start off with, we're going to, you know, still look at the original blocks. We're going to break it up uh, and start with, take a look at the second to last block um, because we know that we can change, if we change that one, it will make a predictable change to the last block. So we're going to, um, we want to start with guessing the last byte of the last block. Um, and what we'll do is we'll kind of put it back here. 
if we want to, if we knew what this value here was, what we could do is XOR this block here with the value of this plain text block, then this, uh, the byte here. So we're going to do that one single byte and XOR that byte here. And if we're correct, then when we do that, that will actually cancel it out. It will go to zero. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to then XOR after we. XOR guess that we're going to XOR it with zero one because what will that that will do is uh, if our guess is correct it will turn this byte here into zero one and that will be a valid pad. So if our guess is correct, the server will tell us our padding was good and then we'll be able to move on. Now now that we know that this byte what this byte is, we can. Only we can next worry about what the value for this byte is. So we're going to uh, try to guess for these last two bytes. We know we know what this one is. So we're trying to XOR the last byte here with the correct value, and we'll work to make guesses until we get the right one here. If we get the right guess here, and we XOR it, then we're going to XOR both of these last. After we XOR with our plain text guesses, we're going to XOR the last two bytes with zero two zero two. The goal is to change the pad to be 0202. So if we know, if we've got a correct guess for the last two block bytes of the plain text block here, we can XOR over here and um, then XOR with the padding of 0202. And if it's correct, we'll get the right pad. And we're just going to keep on doing that one byte at a time. Um, so like once we get a correct thing here, we'll make guesses here. And XOR the final the that value with zero z zero three zero three zero three to in the hope of getting this pad to be zero three zero three zero three. Um one thing I didn't mention about PKCS seven padding is that um because it's always going to assume that it has to be some padding in there, if your message happens to be a multiple of the block size, so in the RK16, then it will require a full block of padding. So in the end, when we uh, finish this block, the goal will be to make this uh, be an entire padding block. So it'll be one zero one zero one zero and X. So uh, I can put in some Python code here how to uh, oh mostly because I used to give you this XOR string function. <laughs> Um, it's not on your game anymore, but um, this also um, works through a simple example um, that you can work through on your own. You know. So yeah, I'm not going to go through all that. Um, before we get into the actual uh, demo, um, I thought I'd also point out some things that. Um, how do you actually go about finding this? So um, it occurred to me that um, there, uh, there should be a way to actually detect padding oracles. Um, the easiest way was that, like what I would do if I was trying to, to find a vulnerable system is I'd look to see if there was something that looked like cybertext that was multiple blocks long. Uh, so, you know, for say a web application, Maybe there's hex or base 64 that encodes something that's uh, a multiple of 16, but at least 32 bytes long. And then I would change the first byte of the first block and see what the response was. And then compare that to changing the last byte of the second to last block, because that should uh, flip the last byte of the last block and make it an invalid pad. I guess like you'd also just change the last block as well. And I, you really want to control it to make sure it's just padding. So yeah, I would just still say last byte of the second to last block will will flip something in the last uh, byte, which should make it an invalid pad. And then um, if you can detect any differences there, then that indicates a likely padding oracle. Um, impossible signs of uh, invalid versus valid pads would be Timing differences, which admittedly, and I, I haven't worked on implementing, um, and then other differences like uh, error messages or different status codes, um, and 
that's what we'll see um, in a moment. Okay. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned before, some real world examples of padding Oracle attacks. Um, so, back in 2014, there was a named vulnerability called Poodle, um, also goes by CVE 2014 um, And then a couple of years later, in Apache mod session crypto, CV 2016-0736. Um, now, in the, uh, this, uh, I just put in the slide here so you don't have to remember or look at the recording. I guess the is recorded, um, you could, but uh, this will include all of the commands for the, uh, the, the uh, to running the attack. So um, you can just review that later if you'd like. But yeah, so I'll bring up the Panning Oracle attack. So in this one, again, there's just a link here. And uh, what it will do is um, if it it's just, it's just going to check to see if the original message is, yeah, <laughs> it's the original message. Um, if you change it to decrypt to something else, so let's just, I'm basically walking through the um, the detection method that I mentioned before. So I'm going to change the first byte of the first block. Um, and it's like, okay, this is invalid data, um, and but it's still valid pad. So I believe it returns a, a 404. Um, and then I'm just going to change the padding. So that should be the last byte of the second to last block. I'll just change the seven to an eight. And it gave this malform data. I could name that much. But I think this one returns a status code for me. So that's basically how it works. And so here I will demo how this attack. So um, briefly, this uh, this tool, which I call for display, has uh, a few different commands that we use. Uh, so if you Use the help command, it will show you what the available commands are right now. Uh, but primarily, uh, one of the main uh, reasons I thought about developing this tool was that uh, it occurred to me that, uh, like especially for something like this, where you have the main algorithm for the attack, and then you have um, what's going to actually interact with the system, and what I, I'm calling here your oracles. Uh, those don't necessarily have to be related to each other. So um, I structured this uh, tool so that it allows you to implement the attack independent of how you interact with any other system. And then you, you write your like Oracle code and you can then mix and match as needed. Um, so uh, in this case, we're gonna use the padding one whole time. Oh, right, I moved <laughs> Break out the that. So actually, I think there's a mistake in the, I was trying to reorganize these so that they were actually like structured under certain categories. Um, so um, we're gonna do counting uh, Markle attack, which then there's a block site for attacks. And then we're gonna, that's why I'm in Oracle. So one other thing that I was kind of proud of doing is that I uh, implemented a um, like the read line functionality here. So it has tab completion and history. Uh, you can even use control R to search for previous commands. Um, but uh, so this Oracle that I have here is um, I call it web status Boolean Oracle. Um, so it's basically going to return uh, true or false um, based on, depending on statuses. So you're going to tell it like, which are, what are the good statuses 
and anything else will be considered a bad one. So, um, and then let's just look at the options. So the other thing that we did here, um, I'm not sure if there's a better way to do it, but you'll notice under the names, uh, anything with, that starts with an O and a colon, uh, that's an Oracle um, parameter. And then the other one is for the actual uh, algorithm. So in this case, um, the algorithm all it requires is the original ciphertext, and then um, these are things just for the Oracle to work. So um, good. We'll grab the ciphertext real quick and set the ciphertext. So this one also you just need the, the base URL. Um, this is going to assume uh, get it, it by default uses a get requests, but you can change it if, if your application uses post requests um, through the verb. Um, since it defaults to get, we're going to leave it alone. Um, also, it needs to know which param is uh, contains the ciphertext. So I'll just put that in there. Um, so I call it C text. Um, if there are any other parameters required, you can um, put that in there as well. And then, as I mentioned, it needs to know what are the good status codes. Um, so I was putting 204 of the right ones. And then to run the, uh, the command, uh, you use the X command. So fingers crossed it's going to work. Oh, the screen is not big. There we go. Um, I guess I'm not sure if it's the screen share or what, but um, what? Um, so yeah, it shows you the decryption as it's going. Uh, I like this one because it's like Hollywood hacking, right? It's what, what it looks like in a movie. Um, one thing that unfortunately because we couldn't see the, the far right of it but um, what it i actually put some special logic in it so that when it's decrypting the first block it assumes that there's going to be um, a valid pkcs7 pad in there so it actually just checks uh, initially for that first byte to find the, the initial padding byte uh, so it actually starts at 16 and goes down um, once it hit, gets a match, then it will do the full pad, make sure that that works, and then continue on. Um, but yeah, so unfortunately, we couldn't see that. So you would see that that first, like the, the padding, the pad comes out really fast with the, you know, like uh, at most code 16 iterations, and then pop over to the rest and it'll start. Uh, actually, right through the description. Uh, so you'll see in hex what the um, valid bytes are, and then it will actually decrypt the message for you. So even though I never actually implemented a way to submit flags, I, this was always structured to be like a CTF style challenge. So I even put the oftentimes these are, are the results of the challenges will be flags like this only flag. Probably braces message they would paste into there or something. And although I don't, I haven't bothered with like lead speak like sometimes uh, is done on CTS. Um, the flags are usually relevant to um, the other given time. Um, so just to wrap up uh, this section, I will say that. Um, Generally, the, so to avoid this attack, either don't use CBC mode, or you want to make sure that you're not leaking out that information about whether or not there was a valid pad decrypted. Um, so usually the best way to do that is uh, to follow uh, Moxie Marlin's uh, 
cryptographic doom principle. Um, and that basically, if I remember that correctly, um, you basically don't want to uh, perform cryptographic operations on untrusted ciphertext. Um, I'm probably mangling that, but, but the idea is um, the way part of the reason why this worked was because we were able to change the ciphertext and it just said, sure, I'll decrypt that. And then, oh, there was a, an error here. And I'll tell you about that error. Um, but if the decryptor first validated that that ciphertext was coming from um, a trusted source before decrypting it, then that would prevent the possibility of a padding oracle because they, it wouldn't even get the time decrypting it. So typically you would use uh, what's called a message authentication code or MAC. Uh, most commonly, you know, people use HMACs, which are hash based message authentication codes. Um, and those are basically special keyed functions uh, that allow you to put like a, essentially an integrity check on a given message. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it, it, so it just provides integrity, it doesn't do anything with confidentiality. Uh, but it should only be a value generated by those who have the private or for the secret key there. So um, both the encryptor and decryptor will need that key in order to do it. Any questions at all about uh, yeah. this section? Yeah. All right. Um, now we're going to shift gears into public key cryptography. Um, and while I mentioned mostly in the, in the intro about encryption, um, I did also mention signatures. And I put this one first because this is one of my favorite. Uh, well, we lead to one of my favorite attacks, mostly because it's um, like high school algebra and ends up breaking that. And there is a particularly, in my opinion, funny uh, example of this in the wild. Uh, so a lot of these slides are going to be kind of like wall of text. Um, we don't, a lot of details aren't that important. I'll just point out where they are. Um, so uh, again, like we're going to write numbers in base 16 because otherwise uh, they can get kind of big. Even I think for my examples, um, and even like, and my examples are often like more toy examples. Like they, you wouldn't need this attack necessarily to, to crack it. Uh, they'd be small enough that a uh, direct attack will work. But just for the purposes of uh, illustrating how this works, um, and uh, a lot of this is being done using modular arithmetic. So. So everybody familiar with modular arithmetic here? Everybody know what that means? Um, yeah, right. So if you're doing addition and multiplication, there's going to be uh, always a, a modulus that you're going to reduce that modulus, whatever, modulus n. So for all the public key stuff that we're dealing with, that's ultimately going to be part of that. Um, and also, um, while I, I put ET, like build the curve in parentheses, um, in this case here, we're going to just work with the regular uh, finite field version. Um, but the, all this stuff basically works the same for the elliptic curve version as well. Okay, this is like wall of text today. You don't need to know all the details of it. There's just like a couple of key things. So in, in regular DSA, um, turns out there are two prime numbers. There's uh, a big prime key and a smaller prime q. Uh, there's a special number g called a generator. And then uh, private key is going to be some random number from zero to q. And the public key will be g to the x mod p. So we're going to raise g to the x power and produce mod p. Uh, and so this, in this case, will be public key, including parameters. So your primes and the generator and the private key is just X. Okay, so uh, to sign a message, uh, we first have to come up with a random, well, I should take that word back. Um, it doesn't have to really be random. What this special K 
number it has to do with, um, needs is it needs to be um, unpredictable and remain secret. Um, but doesn't necessarily mean random. And I'll kind of bring up why uh, random doesn't necessarily need to be the case uh, when we get to the end of the DSA section. Um, but just keep in mind, like, I think this is relates to something I mentioned earlier in that uh, sometimes when people are reading about how the stuff works, they read uh, or make certain assumptions about what certain things mean. So like if it says uh, unpredictable and secret, that doesn't necessarily mean random. It just means unpredictable. <laughs> um, so it has to have some similar properties of randomness, but um, oftentimes when dealing with, when trying to truly do random things, um, it may not be as random as you think. So, um, okay. So yeah, we pick that value K and then we compute this new value R which is g to the k mod p mod q. Uh, and if r happens to be zero, we go back to step one and choose a new k. Uh, and then once we have that r value, uh, we compute this s value, uh, where this is k inverse times, and we're going to um, compute a hash of the message um, and treat that hash value as a number mod q. Uh, added to x times r, where x remember is the private key and r is this value over here. Uh, and we'll do that all mod q, and that's our s value. Okay. So um, just uh, quickly, this k inverse value here, what that means is that um, this k inverse is a number such that if you multiply it by k and reduce mod q, you'll get back one. Um, so it's sort of like dividing. Um, you can kind of think of this as being like h plus x times r all over k, mm -hmm. but we're not really doing division. We're, we're kind of doing the equivalent thing in modular there. And then the signature is going to be these two values, r and s. Um, verification, I put this in here just for your knowledge if you want to look at it, but uh, for this purpose, we actually don't care because um, we're just going to look at a signature that is valid, but we're um, going to uh, be able to recover the private key. Okay. So in this, this is kind of a warm up again, um, and I'm referring to this as the the known nonce attack. So that k value is oftentimes called a nonce, um, and um, if you happen to, I mentioned before that. It needs to remain secret. So, if that secrecy is ever um, lost and somebody ever gets the k value, uh, it turns out you can just solve for x. Um, so, this is I worked out the algebra here, so you can just look at that equation. But um, basically, how it works is you multiply both sides of this equation by k first. That will cancel this one out and so you'll have k times s over here. Then you multiply both sides by s inverse. Um, and then um, you distribute that through. Uh, you'll have to subtract the s times h on that side and then multiply both sides by r inverse. Um, and that's how you get this. Um, OK. So. Like really, if you, if you have a signature, so that's gonna be, remember, it's gonna give you the R and the S values, and you happen to get K, you also have the message H, then you have all of the values on the right side here. So you, just, you, can, you can compute X. Um, so yeah, here's another example, if you wanna work out. Um, and I did actually implement this one in my crypto display tool. Um, this one is, probably not super realistic. I'm not sure if I can think of it ever hearing this one show up in the real world. But I know, yeah, I, I recall hearing about this one, but again, it's a, it's a nice warm up. Um, and so um, for a lot of these public key attacks, there's usually gonna be at least two stages here because um, the first step is that we need the public key 
and then um, in this case, we're going to be attacking signatures. Um, other ones will, will be doing other things. But um, so you'll see here, there's actually um, yeah, two sets of slides. Um, it's the first one would be how we're going to get the public key and how we're going to actually attack. Um, so uh, back here, we'll see that um, a lot of these, I think actually all of them should. Um, have usually three different, at least three different, well, maybe like two in one case, um, but there'll be different links here. Um, so here's where you're going to get the public key. And just for simplicity here, um, I'm uh, using J JSON to do this. Um, he's, you know, you can imagine somebody trying to do a web application to do this. Uh, we'll just maybe send everything over JSON. Uh, so in this case, the public key includes all the parameters and the Y value here. Uh, this one, uh, where I got it? Uh, it doesn't stay in raw mode, but it, um, so uh, because I need this for the next one, I decided to do the same thing here, but uh, the message actually comes from the uh, fortune command uh, on here. So it just every time you hit it, it's going to be some random fortune message. Um, and then the way that you actually solve the challenge is by submitting a, a signature using the private key. So, um, and, and you have to sign a particular message. That, that private key. So um, when you just uh, use the, the get method, it returns this. Um, and when you post the uh, signature, it should, the correct signature, it should uh, return the flag. Okay. So the first step is getting that public key. And um, I want to try and keep the, the, the basic command set fairly limited. So uh, what I did end up creating was um, what I call the generic module. Um, and what this will just do is um, run any Oracle. And then you could have the Oracles be the things that go out and grab things like public keys. So there actually are no options for this module you can see there's nothing there yet but if we use oracle and then in this one um yes yeah, so one thing that um the way that i structured this is that I figured that uh, different JSON representations of the key may choose to use different, I don't know, <laughs> using key for different things, but different uh, keys in terms of like a JSON key, like what you use to select the data out of the JSON um, for um, corresponding components of a, uh, a public key. So that allows you to specify that here um, and then just give the url if there's anything else that is needed for uh, making the request you can put that down here as well but these are not required um, so for uh, this one if we just see i'll leave it in the json mode here we see that the keys that are here are gp q and y and it turns out that um, it's it's the same here. So the components is like what how we would internal like the, the tool itself internally represents those uh, parts of the public key, and then the, the keys option here is how the JSON data structure represents those. And so you just you denote that as a comma separated list.
So in this case, I am sending the components to GPQ and Y, and then I'm going to do the same thing for keys. And then I'll set the URL for where to get the public key. And just execute it to run the. Oh no. <laughs> what do we do wrong? Make sure everything is set So there turns out there is a uh, actually there's a log file. So if there are ever exceptions, um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I wrote the status all this, and they say a module. Oh, um, it should be updated, but um, they can't get the detail box. Hmm. Um, is anybody else having the same problem? Um, so it, it should have already had everything installed. You just should have done hit them shell to um, start it. I, I just did hit them shell. Uh, it shouldn't be all the depends. You should be installed already. Is there anybody else have this on? Um, yeah. Yeah, just do Python and group display. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we'll take a minor break now. I've been going for over an hour, so. Like the last time it's 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 like the
Yeah, so I I think you must have gotten to your you haven't even get to where it's today. Um so you did I did it out your call further ahead of that. We ran it. <laughs> so I um, so for those of you who are online, um, I think what happened uh, was that uh, something. Sometimes the virtual environments can get messed up uh, with them. Um, so uh, if you ever end up in the wrong virtual environment, um, or sometimes it will, you'll be in the virtual environment, but it's sort of not, <laughs> you can be in this weird state. So if it's not working, I would say like exit, try control D or exit or whatever to um, exit out of that shell. Uh, if you're still in the terminal and then they close out your terminal, then uh, that probably means that, that that shell was closed and try going to uh, go back to the crypt display directory, pip M shell again, and it should work. Um, so, um, yeah, I, we're troubleshooting things just because I've been using hit them for long enough now that um, I've, I've done dealt with similar things. Um, yeah, I've, I've only been using Pipem for I think a little while now. Um, theoretically, it's nice because it, it does better than like requirements like text and pinning version dependencies, but. Uh, it can sometimes be a pain to work with. Um, okay. I don't know why this isn't working and it's concerning because that can um, be an issue for the rest of the challenges. Um, sometimes, actually, you know what? I'm going to actually slide back to this. I wouldn't be surprised. If it just got into a weird state because I just finished one. So I'm gonna try rerunning it all in a fresh instance of the tool. Oh not bad. All right. Yeah. 
we'll see in the next one of us. So, okay, let me just also check to see. Is, has anybody else been able to get this to work on their VM? Um, so, just to go over again, use generic or the module, then use Oracle Web JSON public key. Set so, components GPQY. Set keys GPQY. And then uh, Set URL the URL here. Is it working for anybody else? Or are you getting the same error that I have? Like that? Um, <laughs> has anybody else managed to get us to work on that? I'm going to try and just restarting again. Say it again, I think it's in a weird state. <laughs> Oh, uh, we are on. So it should be under the uh, ECDSA. So if you go to the right to here and then we're down here. Everything that is required is there. All right. Okay. I think at this point, may need to move on. Um, fortunately, this is something that um, you have the, the commands in the, the slides uh, and probably this evening I will try to debug this and so uh, maybe tomorrow do a get pull um, to see if there are any updates and then hopefully that should fix it <laughs> but I mean it's, I think I tried to make the whole thing as updatable as possible so if there's any issues here you still have the VM you can try and Fix it. We can try and fix it for later. Um, uh, okay. um, so I'll, it looks like I tried pulling the public key for this one too, and it's also not working. So we'll see how much of the rest of these we'll actually be able to do. Um, but okay. Um, so we'll move on to the next DSA attack. Now, this is something um, that has shown up. 
uh, quite a bit actually. And um, I'll talk about some of the famous examples of why, how I first came to learn about this attack. But this one's um, I think known as the repeated nonce attack. So in this instance, um, we're gonna uh, have a case where there are two signatures for different messages, but the same K value got used. Now we don't know what that K value is, but uh, we, we just can tell that it's the same. And the reason is because R comes from the K value. Yeah, R comes from the K value. So if we see a repeated R value, then we know that K is the same. And so um, recalling that, um, so remember that in the signature creation uh, slide, we had S and K on the opposite sides here. Basically what I did was um, I sort of cross multiplied um, that e original equation where it was S equals K time, K inverse times this stuff. Um, so I basically multiplied both sides by S inverse and by K. Um, and since those K values are the same, you get this situation here where you have K equals S and K also equals this value here this thing here. Now, um, that means we can set these right side, the, the right side of both these equations equal to each other, and then solve for x, because now uh, we have an equation where we know everything except for the private key. And um, so it's just a matter of solving algebraically. And it turns out the final equation is this down here. Uh, so yeah, again, worked out some simple example um, but um, some examples from the real world um so there were some bitcoin implementations uh especially i think on android um uh, where it was repeating the the knots and one of the nice things about uh, this kind of vulnerability showing up on the blockchain is that it's there forever so you can always um uh, search the blockchain to find these. Now, I think odds are all of the wallets that this happened to um, have been cleared out because um, either somebody found out that they and transferred themselves or if somebody was malicious, um, they would be able to get the private key and then transfer it to their own wallet. Um, but um, because basically all you need to do is um, if you take the verifying code for the, the blockchain, you just um, want it to uh, save in like a database all of the public keys and corresponding signatures. And then um, if you receive in the database a match on the R value, you can run this attack. Um, there was also some research done, uh, I think a little over 10 years ago on SSH servers um, and this vulnerability showed up there. And then this one is the one that uh, I just found hilarious. Um, so Sony PlayStation 3. So again, kind of old, but um, in this situation, um, they were using ECDSA, and I think they had their own implementation to sign their games. Uh, but uh, they ended up using the same K value for all of their signatures, which means if you just take any two games and uh, you can run this attack and you get the, the signing key. And this was something that was uh, of uh, particular value because uh, this was, I think somebody uh, discovered this after they disabled the ability to run Linux on PlayStation 3. So by getting the signing key, you can now sign Linux and the PlayStation will run it just fine. So, uh, Again, here are the commands. So it will, this is the one that doesn't need to be working right now. I'll have to debug that tonight um, to get the public key. And then, um, you're right. Uh, one thing to mention for the known non-speed, non-stack, um, but there's a, a copy command. And so what the copy command does in exploit is it will take the output from the last run uh, module and copy it into an option for the current module. Um, so you need to start the repeat nonce module first and then copy it, the public key uh, that you get from the previous one there. Um, and then 
there's this signature oracle, which will just get JSON signatures. It's similar to the other one. It has this components and keys. So it tells you which one to use. And um, here, um, one of the options is if the JSON uh, tells you which hash algorithm it was using, um, specify it. So you put that in there, um, put the URL in, run execute, and that should uh, run the attack. You'll pop out the private key. All right, so let's, that's all for DSA. Um, there aren't, I think, a whole lot of, uh, to my knowledge, I don't really know that much for DSA and ECDSA. I do know that uh, for elliptic curve DSA, uh, there is a lattice based attack if there are, are biases in the K values. Um, and uh, I think one of the, the researchers for the crypto talk this morning uh, mentioned. Uh, a fault attack on a DSA, which is it's basically EDS, ACDSA, but they use a special kind of elliptic curve called an Edwards curve. Uh, and they also deterministically generate K. Um, so you avoid the uh, the problem with the, the randomness. Of, except I actually forgot to mention that with this one here, uh, it seemed to be a case of poor entry values on embedded systems like um, Knots router, things like that, for generating your SSH keys. All right, so onto RSA. Um, so this one, I think the biggest section that I have. Um, yeah. So um, we'll briefly discuss what RSA is and um, then get to some of the attacks. Uh, all right. So um, in um, to generate an RCA key, um, you choose two distinct prime numbers, P and Q, and they have to be similar magnitude but different length by a few digits. Um, and you compute the, oops, this uh, n value, which is P times Q. You also have to compute phi of n, which is p minus one times p minus one, which also happens to be this. You could write it this way, so you don't, if you don't want to do any multiplication. Um, and then to you know, you usually end up generating the the public key first and computing the private key out of that. So you pick an integer e from one to phi of n. Typically, there are actually some standard E values. Uh, historically, earlier on, people chose three. Um, then uh, the most common one nowadays is 65537, uh, which is two to the 16 plus one. Um, but sometimes you will see other values. Um, but those are the uh, two to the 16 plus one is the most common. Nowadays. And then you compute D, uh, which is E inverse mod phi of n and your public key is this the uh, public exponent in the corresponding rsa modulus and private key is just the the d which is a private exponent okay and to encrypt a message um, we view a message m as a number from zero to n we raise it to the e power mod n and then to decrypt we raise that the cybertext to the d power mod n. So one interesting thing about RSA is it has uh, a lot of symmetry in that um, you could do uh, this, you could switch which exponent you're using and it looks the same. And um, that's actually how RSA signatures came about uh, because in this situation, instead of uh, the um, a public person encrypting a message and the, the private key owner decrypting it, what they're going to do is you can sort of think of it as the private key owner is encrypting the message and the uh, person with the public key can verify it by decrypting the message. So basically, like really what it would be is you send the message and like you, it's almost like you encrypted it in RSA and then 
the uh, verifier checks that the message they received equals um, the, the decryption of it. Um, so RSA has some interesting properties. One of those is that it's homomorphic in multiple, uh, multiplicatively homomorphic. Um, so what that means is that um, if you have um, two messages, M1 and, and M2, and they're both encrypted, if you multiply the ciphertext together, that's actually the same thing as if you encrypted the product of the original messages. So here we are definitely thinking of them as numbers. Um, and um, this actually leads to um, another, uh, what we call adaptive chosen ciphertext attack, um, which is actually what kind of attack the counting oracle that we did earlier was. Um, in this situation here though, like this is kind of a warm up to um, the, uh, the, the next attack. Or actually, I don't think we're going to cover that one yet, but um, the, this property is important later on for our same text. Um, so in this situation here, uh, what you can do is, let's say you have an oracle that will decrypt any message only once uh, and so if it ever sees the same message again, it won't decrypt it, but if it sees a new message, it will. Then what you can do is um, generate a, like basically you encrypt a random number and then multiply it by the ciphertext. That should be a new number that the decryption oracle has never seen before. Um, it will send you back the decryption and then you can use that to um, decrypt the original message by multiplying the result in the Oracle by our inverse. Um, so this is one that I don't actually uh, have in the, the crypt display tool. Is, again, it's not like a, a terribly realistic one. So this one should work on our own. We're just going to use the Python interpreter instead of the crypt display. So this one we can we should be able to get together. Okay. And this one it, it's set up much more simply. So uh, in this case here, we have uh, the RSA modulus, uh, which I wrote in hex. The um, the E value is actually decimal, and then the uh, ciphertext is also in hex. Oddly, they're not the same case. Which is weird. But, uh, so. What we would, and then um, there's this Oracle page where you can submit ciphertext values. And if it's one that it hadn't seen before, it will decrypt it. Uh, like it basically send you back a number. Um, so we'll, we'll go through how to do this. So first I'm just copying the end value. And I'm just going to put zero. So even though we wrote the next, it still knows that as that number. Uh, e is 65537. And C is. Right there. Um, so if we go to the Oracle and try to submit that one, we should see that uh, it's not going to give it to us. Oh. oh, shoot. This one needs to be updated. Okay. I haven't really actually, I didn't, I didn't check this one. Um, okay. So again, your VM should get an update. Um, I thought this one was still, it was good, but. I now remember what the issue is. So, oops. All right. But the 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 process would be that um, what we you would do. We can kind of work through the what the um, right process is. Um, so first, we want to generate an R value. 
So we'll just get a random value. So, one thing that I like to do uh, with a lot of these RSA attacks is that, oh, actually, yeah, I guess I'll demonstrate. Yeah, actually, I don't really need to do it because this will check it for you. Um, so, one way to get R inverse is to use the built in pal function. So, you just do um, R negative one and N, and that will give you R inverse. So, this should almost, it should. Basically, never happened, but I was just kind of curious um, if it ever will. Uh, so, one thing that uh, will come up when it, if you ever have an RSA attack that involves computing an inverse, um, then that is dependent on um, that value not having any common factors with N, namely that P or Q are not a factor of R. Um, if it ever happens to be the case that it is, then you can factor it in and you don't need the, the rest of the attack. You just crack the key. Uh, if that ever did happen, then it would the uh, PAL function would throw an error saying uh, unable to compute R inverse. So um, I just something like if you ever were doing this in real life and then this ever failed, then you're like, oh, well, actually, the thing better, I can just uh, recover N and then. Get the private key. Um, okay, but anyway, what you would do here is uh, you would do like um, I'm running C, C prime equals, and then you know, I'm a little cautious about modular arithmetic, so I would just do um, exponential r to the e power my n times c. And then make sure that that also produces by the end. And then um, you would, uh, once we get this, once I get the challenge fixed, um, you would get the hex value for that and then put it in here. Whenever it sent back to you, you would then um, multiply the return value by R inverse. And then um, you can use the int two bytes um, method. So, like um, in Python, there's a two bytes method for integers. Um, so you can just do. You need to know how big it is. So you have to compute what the the size is. But um, so you can specify how long it, how long the uh, Thing is, uh, what you can get from the bit length. You just need to divide that by eight and round up. Um, so you would do like C dot two bytes and then put that number in, comma, bit. And that, that will give you the original message. So unfortunately, that's all we're not working. I swear I tested this a lot. <laughs> well, not that one. <laughs> Was there anything else before? So I'm surprised that the trip squad was not working. All right. Um, So are there any questions about the like the homomorphic properties of RSA? Okay, so um, a key thing about 
this next attack is uh, um, and as you can see, it's called Blankenbacher 06. So um, Blankenbacher is a famous uh, cryptanalyst who has come up with multiple RSA attacks. And so you have to, you can't just say like Blankenbacher to be specific. Um, so this one came from uh, a rip ROM session at Crypto 2006, um, where he demonstrated a way to uh, forge RSA signatures uh, using the, where the uh, the public exponent is three, uh, and this still actually, uh, well, again, it's I haven't seen it but super recently. I think like twenty seventeen or so. It's down in the slides. Um, there was a basically the, the same vulnerability in Python. But, uh, yeah, so. Uh, in practice, uh, as in, like when I was describing RSA signatures before, I was just saying like, oh, just take the message, raise it to the private exponent, and that's your signature. But uh, in reality, your message may not be small enough, um, or it might be too small. And so, uh, what we actually do is we sort of um, do that out process on the hash, but we also want to pad it to make sure that it's the appropriate size. Um, so there's what's called the PKCS 1.5 padding. And so whenever you're signing something you was using RSA, uh, it follows this format. So um, this is what happens before you raise it to the deep power or before you apply the RSA operation. So this is just the padding. So you um, you have a byte array that's going to start off with a byte of zero, then a byte of one, then a whole bunch of Fs, then a zero byte, and then this ASN one um, value is uh, a special byte string that uh, it will uh, that tells you which hash function is um, that was used to hash the message and then then the final hash uh, so the problem comes up when trying to verify the signature um, so oftentimes what uh, implementations to verify signatures would do is uh, you know they take the signature they'd raise it to the e power mod n and they then they verified that um, you know they got zero 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 one. They got a whole bunch of Fs, then a zero, then ASN one, and then the hash. But it doesn't check to make sure that the uh, Fs are the appropriate size, partially because um, depending on what hash function, that's going to affect how many Fs it is. So it would uh, it would you couldn't know like if you were just verifying it starting from left to right. You wouldn't know how many apps were needed and until after you were at least got to here because once you got to once you read this part then you know which hash function is which would mean you know how big this is um, but oftentimes the verification didn't go back and say did i see an, enough f values here so what that meant is that if you could uh, construct a signature such that when it was raised to the eighth power um, it looked like this and then maybe had some garbage after it, then um, there'd be verification um, code that would still say, yeah, that's fine, because it would stop at the end of the hash and wouldn't notice if there's anything else left there. Um, so the way that um, he actually described this was like a, a paper and pencil way of exploiting it. Uh, and, and Basically, the way it works is um, like the way, the way you can do this in practice is by basically taking the cube root of. And remember that I uh, mentioned this is basically applicable to small exponents like three. Um, so in that case, you you take the cube root like just the regular cube root on your calculator um, of something that looks like this, where you have zero 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 one f. Zero zero into one 
hash and then garbage, and then rounding it should uh, so that it's an integer should produce something where when you uh, cube it back again, the highest bits up through here are still okay, uh, but the garbage might change, but we didn't really care what the garbage was anyway. Uh, so this example is kind of, I will sort of slowly go through it, but it, this one is actually like a legitimately sized one. Um, so this is a full RSA modulus. Uh, and uh, in this example, it's trying to forge a particular signature. So that's the message. Um, so this is the tag that was generated through forging it. Um, if you cube that, uh, you should get this. And I've color coded what each section was. So this is like that uh, little header portion with the 0, 0, 0, 1, and the Fs, the 0. This is the ASN1 um, portion that tells you which hash function. This is the actual hash, and then the rest of it is garbage. And so there, there would be verification code that would just be like, all right, first byte zero, yes. Zero, second byte zero one, yes. All right, next one, F, okay. Keep iterating until we see a zero. Okay, there's a zero. As long as we all make sure that you have all Fs until you hit a zero. So that would check out. Then um, read the next part, which is the ASN1 um, notation to tell you what hash function is. Then read your hash and does it match the message? If it does, verify it. Um, so um, in the real world, this did show up in Bouncy Castle uh, Java API 2007 and oh, it's 2016. Uh, in the Python RSA implementation, uh, I don't think it. I think there was there might have been a slight variation to this, but uh, there was a similar uh, vulnerability there. Uh, uh, there is a uh, a challenge for this one. Oh, shoot. Another broken one. Okay. I'll try and get that one fixed too. Um, but we'll move on to the next one because the next two I think are more interesting. Um, again, it looks like the print uh, display is broken again. So we may not actually be able to go through the challenges, but uh, I'll sort of explain what these two. Uh, vulnerabilities are. So um, the first one is, um, so this, uh, you may not be familiar with this name, but you may more may have heard this uh, called the Chinese remainder theorem. I just figured that Wikipedia says who the name of the person who developed it. So I wanted to make sure the credit was given where it was due. Uh, but uh, this is going to be um, bad signatures when using the Chinese remainder of the example or census. Okay, so um, it turns out that if you know the private exponent uh, in RSA, then uh, you also can factor the, the modulus. So it doesn't hurt to store the primes uh, with the, the private exponent. Uh, so what um, what you can do is you can actually reduce the calculations for the private exponent mod p and mod q and do them separately there and then put it back together using the Chinese remainder there. Um, so oftentimes you will see um, if you look at RSA private keys generated by OpenSSL, it will store all of this information. It will store the D and then um, these DPDQ, which are the um, values of D mod P minus one and P minus one. Uh, and there's also a, an additional value to allow you to, to uh, use this theorem for more efficient um, signing. Uh, and the reason for the why you want to do this oftentimes is that 
um, sometimes the, the hardware that's doing the signing is maybe more limited than the hardware that's verifying, like it might be on a smart card or something. So uh, trying to make the operations more efficient can be very helpful. Uh, so the problem is that uh, if you make a mistake in the calculations for one of those components, but not both, then it will uh, turn out that the results will differ by what it should be uh, by a factor of the one that had the error. So um, like in, in this case here. So um, suppose that we computed M to the uh, D sub P mod P correctly, but uh, M to the D sub Q mod Q was incorrect. Um, after applying the Chinese, we'll, we'll apply the Chinese remainder theorem and put it back together. And uh, the verifier will see that M does not equal S to the E power. Um, but uh, what they can do is compute the difference between M and S to the E. And I'm uh, oh, sorry, I think my goofed up which one was divisible by that. It'll turn out that that will be divisible by the, the, the correct prime uh, and not the other one. So if you compute the GCD of this, then you'll get uh, back the, the original prime. Um, let's just double check the, this. Um, we try one more time with Crypto's Boy and see if it will work. Yeah. We change these to in N. Change the URL to the other challenge. Okay, I wish I could demonstrate this one too. So what this one does is it, uh, it grabs the sign messages here. Um, so I think in this case, I just had to sign the same message. Um, yeah. Um, but then I just introduce a random error in one component, um, and uh, there actually is a crypt display module that will um, detect that the signature is incorrect, and then try to compute the GCD. And if it gets a value that's between one and n, then it will display that and give you a, an RSA private key. Unfortunately, that's not working. Um, Another worked out example if you want to do the math by hand. Um, this one, I think I'll just briefly mention because um, there's a lot of math. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. This one, yeah, I, I think like. I might move this one further back to toward the like balance material, but this attack is one that actually attacks the public key itself. Uh, and this one, I did find an actual public key that was vulnerable to this. Um, but ba basically, what this this tries to solve the same problem that using the Chinese remainder theorem solves um, in a different way. So to try to make the signing more efficient. Um, then uh, uh, for more constrained hardware. Uh, so uh, typically with the standard RSA public exponents that you get, uh, like even 65537, the private exponent is going to be very large. It's going to be almost as big as N. So 
uh, doing those operations, it's going to be a lot more computational and expensive than doing the public key operations. So sometimes the um, designer wants to have a smaller exponent. Now, obviously, they're not going to pick something that small as 65537 because somebody could just brute force that. But um, it, it still would be better to have a, a significantly smaller uh, private exponent. And so if the private exponent is less than about a quarter of the, uh, the bits as the modulus, I believe. Um, so like in the case of a 4096-bit RSA key, which is about as big as you ever see nowadays, um, if the private modulus, private exponent, right, is less than 10.4 bits, I believe, then this attack will work. Um, and usually the way that you can see this is um, if you see particularly large public exponents, then I would try this attack. Um, this may also be something that I didn't update on this version of the... Uh, oh, it is there. I can cool. So, um, oh, this one I think we can actually do. So maybe we can do this one for time. Um, okay. So, in this one, uh, I found a, uh, a cert from, I think it was scans.io uh, years ago. They seem to have closed it down, so it still requires um, a, an account that, like, I think you need to demonstrate that you are an actual researcher. Whereas, like, seven years ago, you could just go online onto their site and just download uh, tarballs of certs from the internet, uh, tons and tons of them. And um, so it turns out that um, one of them um, had uh, it was vulnerable to attack. Um, so um, in this case, I'm going to use the open command. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, wait, wait, I forgot. I forgot how the tool work. Um, so the open command um, actually wants you to specify um, what um, file you're opening. And I think this is an X509 cursor. So open that and then the download right there. Okay. And then we're going to end um, Okay, yeah, so um, this one, the module is, is very simple. You just give it a public key. Uh, and it will check what type of public key it is um, on its own. So you'll be importing this from um, a, uh, an assert. And you can actually see some of the assert information here. And so this works. There. OK. Um, so I actually need to actually update this one. Actually, not. So this one. Um, it shows you what the public exponent was. Is so um, you can see the e value is very large, right? Uh, that's it's a pretty big e value. Usually it's only a few digits long. This one's pretty big uh, and similar in size I think, to the n value. And we were able to compute this is the d value. Um, it's still, I think, too big to try and directly brute force, but. Uh, it's still vulnerable to this attack. And uh, here I'm just displaying all the uh, parameters that are needed to uh, make an RSA key, RSA private key. Uh, and then I don't want to, I don't remember if I can do this as it is, but uh, there should be a way to, I think if 
Actually, maybe I'll, I'll try it. Um, I'm going to see if I can actually write this key out. Take a look. Yeah, so this uh, file, which was not in your script display uh, folder before, uh, is the RSA public private key for the corresponding assert that um, comes from this attack. So, uh, yeah, I didn't want to get too much into the, the details because it's kind of detailed math, but um, I could just figure it out to share this. And actually, there's something that I could get to work. Um, I don't have the, I don't think I. I haven't updated this. Um, when I actually put this into GitHub, I didn't include the uh, the cert file because uh, I think it was fairly large. Um, but um, I don't know. It, I'm on the fence as to whether or not I'll actually include this one in the VM because I think it's like two gigs. So if you were to ever do an update, it would take a while to download it. But I'll, I'll quickly go over what the, this attack is about. Um, so this was something that uh, found that it was uh, pretty applicable because, uh, and I mentioned this earlier with the repeated non-DSA attack, uh, that uh, with embedded systems, there was uh, a lack of entropy and and it would cause uh, multiple RSA keys to generate the same first prime, but a second diff uh, a different second prime. And so, if you know that that's the case between two RSA moduli, then you can just compute the GCD of those two values, and that'll give you the prime number um, that was in common. But you know, if you're given a large set of RSA keys, you don't know necessarily which ones had that happen. Uh, so batch GCD uh, allows you to efficiently compute this. Um, basically what it does is it first creates this factor tree that, uh, so you like take the entire list of RSA moduli, and then as you build up the tree, um, each level up is the product of the two below it until you get to the product of everything. And then you do this remainder tree where you're, uh, basically reducing um, down, uh, you're reducing the product mod um, n minus, uh, so n sub i squared. Uh, and then uh, you get, and then you'll just have this um, large list of values at the bottom of that tree. And then you, you, you just do um, GCD of that with, all the other ones. So instead of trying to do each one pairwise, which would be uh, n squared, if you have n keys, it'd be n squared uh, GCDs, whereas this one it would just be um, n GCDs um, after doing that initial cost. Um, I don't think I actually implemented this one yet in display. It was actually uh, in the planning on maybe I did. Let me see. Uh, I think I started to put it in there, but yeah. Um, but this was actually something that I did um, like seven years ago. I uh, ran this on an EC2 instance, the one with one of the large memory ones. And uh, I used more than just that one tarball tar of a what's it? Of uh, certs, um, I had a huge data set and just ran the batch GCD algorithm on all of them. Uh, and 
I tracked quite a few of them. Uh, I didn't know what else to do with it, so I uh, I wrote it in a Twitter bot that just tweets out the primes that I factored. Um, so if you ever want to check out RSA primes on Twitter, um, you'll just see tons of tweets of primes that came from factoring certs that were found on the internet. Um, the last one we'll talk about, um, I think we'll, since we uh, weren't able to get through, uh, get the challenges through, or the tool works very well, um, is, uh, I, I think it was known as both chain of pools and curveball. And so if anybody was in the talk this morning um, on the practical crypto exploits uh, in Windows, uh, this was the vulnerability that they were talking about. Uh, but um, so briefly, I'll just talk about elliptic curves. Um, so uh, elliptic curves are mathematical objects where it's um, defined by uh, a certain type of equation. And it, if you were to graph them in the real plane, then um, it looks they tend to look something like this. And it turns out that um, because it's a cubic equation, any line uh, that intersects the curve will hit it in three points. So you can always define an operation um, based on the three points that intersect the curve and the line. So uh, it has this, this uh, property that P plus Q plus R. So if you add up all of the points along the line, that's equal to zero. In other words, R is P plus Q doesn't equal R. It actually equals minus R. Um, R is actually, if you flip along the X axis um, and then to double a point. So if, if it's, that's when the line is tangent to the curve, um, you'll get the, the other point. Oh, well, the other point will be minus twice the Point Q. Um, yeah, here's showing what the opposite is. And uh, zero is actually this sort of point at infinity. Uh, you know, uh, it's not really on the curve in affine coordinates, but it's like an extra point that you can have. Um, and okay, so um, for the purposes of cryptography, we are usually working on elliptic curves over finite fields. Um, usually, it's it's either a, a, a prime field or um, or fields that are characteristic to. So it's going to be a field where the size is two to a power. Um, for simplicity, I just think of usually think of it in terms of the prime fields, but because um, the curves work a little differently. Otherwise, um, and um, we call the order of um, a point P, uh, which is in this case Q, will be the smallest number that such that Q times P equals zero, um, and uh, so for elliptic curve cryptography, uh, it works similar to. What we saw with DSA, where in that case you had this generator G and a private key was X and the public key was G to the X. In this case, uh, we're going to call the private key K from the uh, it's going to be from zero to Q, which is the order of P, uh, and the, the public key is K times P. And it turns out that the the problem of trying to find K given the a uh, given a point is currently hard to do. Uh, so no, I, I always like the uh, the name Chain of Fools because it made me think of uh, the scene from the movie Sneakers. Has anybody seen Sneakers before? No? Classical, like, yeah, like uh, it's basically about people who uh, uh, steal a box from a mathematician who finds a way to uh, efficiently factor RSA moduli. I mean, that part's fictional, but... Um, like this is this movie about like what what that was possible. Okay, so uh, the the chain of fools vulnerability uh, 
or as a, I guess they were calling it upstairs, a curveball uh, arises when um, you uh, typically an operating system will store certain certificates uh, that are known and trusted. Uh, and then when it tries to verify something, it will check to see if a given cert is in its store and can be trusted or not. Um, but one of the problems that came up was that um, it would check to see if the cert was in its store based on the public key, uh, which is just that, that point um, that was like K times P. And, um, but it wouldn't, um, but when it actually used the certificate, it would use the parameters that were given in the certificate, uh, which would also include the generator. Um, so um, basically, if, if you are verifying that the, the public key is what you've seen before, but you are allowed to tell it what the generator is, then you can um, create a new private key that corresponds to the same public key. Um, and the way that you do that is, um, so like if the original generator was P and the public key was Q, um, now you make the, the new certificate with public key Q and the private key will be, uh, you pick any arbitrary value X. Um, in their example, they oftentimes chose two. And then the new generator would be two inverse times Q. Uh, in this case, two inverse mod the, uh, the generator or the order of the group. Um, and so the values, yeah, the values that the um, person verifying gets the public key Q, and now it says use this generator here instead of the, the standard generators. Because one of the things about elliptic curves is that as opposed to uh, DSA, where um, there weren't like standard primes that we would use, um, so you could um, basically give somebody any primes you wanted. Um, with elliptic curves, there are standard curves that are always used. Um, and so you like, oftentimes you give it the name of the curve and it would know, okay, um, these are the parameters for the equation. And um, this is the generator. Um, so I know how to uh, work off of that. Um, but in this case, it was saying, okay, I know it's this curve, but I'm going to take your generator. And, uh, so I don't think it will work here, uh, but this is what the, uh, the challenge is supposed to do. So in this case, uh, we don't need an existing signature. We're just going to go off of the list of public keys. So here I just generated a whole bunch of keys, like well, in this case, five keys. And what the the challenge is, and is that you have to submit a signed message, um, just sign the message to chain of pools, but you have to use one of these public one of these public keys has to be used to verify it. And what the the tool will do is um, it will create a uh, corresponding private key and generator to submit to the uh, signature verification. And um, so it will just check to see based on the public key if this is something that uh, exists or not. And if it does, then um, it will use the generator, verify the signature, and if it verifies, um, it will. Uh, return back the message. Um, I want to try one last time to see if this will work. So, this one is kind of fun. Right? So here, if you see, um, there are two ones here. It's name and then public key. That's just going to be the the point 
um, depends on the I think the I think this is one where the internal value is called the public key and the JSON was please no good so Oh, uh, there's actual X response there. And then oh, more than this one. I don't know why it didn't for the other ones, but I don't know. Okay, so in this case, now we have a list of um, object curve public keys. And so let's now. I know we can call it a chain of pools. And so first we copy the public keys over. Now for this one, um, okay, <laughs> because they're already copied, it's kind of a lot. But there, there are two options for this module. So one is the, the list of public keys. Um, and then um, I have another parameter that's optional called which keys. So you can either provide a comma separated list um, or just leave a blank. If it, you leave a blank, it will operate on all the keys if you just to tell it I want only these ones, uh, it will just uh, create prior keys for those. Um, so I'm just going to say, um, let's take key two. And then I can do. Okay, so here it uh, actually generated a private key for this one. And then we're going to use the Send the signature module. Uh, we're going to copy the private key. Uh, all right. Okay. So here, um, So we're going to send the message chain of keys. Um, we're going to tell it use PCBSA. Oops, and use that um, algorithm. PCBSA. Um, and then, oh, I need to fix this also. This shouldn't be a required argument because the uh, implementation of ECDSA doesn't take a hash algorithm argument, but I'm just going to put something in here for now uh, to satisfy the two. Uh, and then this one is um, these are flags to the, the signature module to just tell it do I want it to include the public key and do I want it to include the Parameters for the public key. Mm -hmm. And then we can set both of those to true. And then use the, um, let me use the web host JSON signature or phone. And then, and then and I forget 
I'm going to shoot for a second and look at the source code. All right, yeah, so uh, the data that we're going to send it includes, um, it's going to have a signature in the signature, or for key, use the key signature for signature, and for the message, public key, pub key for the public key, for RAMs for the parameters. So, do signature M of key in params. I think they're the same on the other uh, the challenge we're attacking. So a little bit of inconsistency in the end of the Hopefully this works. Oh, no. Wait, I'm going to get it. Worked before. <laughs> okay. Goop this up this is the way I goofed up this time. Um, so this does show the public key here. Should have been this one. Mm -hmm. You know what this looks like? I don't think I've seen it. Oh, wait, no. Never mind. Oh. All right, well, it worked the other night when I was testing this. Uh, the demo guys have not been happy with me today, I guess. Um, they're not kind to me. But um, at any rate, I think that covers all the material that I have. Um, I will check to see if I can figure out what the, the problems are and uh, hopefully get some fixes. Your VMs should just automatically update, except the tool you'll need to get pull. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so if you just go into Crypt Display and then type git pull, um, so yeah, just literally, uh, yeah, so just literally do that and it should pull uh, any changes I yeah so um and if it yeah so it says are you up to date if it says like the pip file change then you would want to do pip install but I don't think it should so 
anything else, uh, you should just be able to uh, then open up that tool again and it should hopefully work. Um, and, um, yeah, um, I am on Twitter. I haven't been as much lately, um, but that might be the best way to, to um, let me know if you have any issues. Um, I don't know. I would like this is a good way to end it. Like, how about that? And I like starting. Oh, what's that? Um, on Twitter. Oh, I have two. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. This one should be. Yeah. This is me. Oh. Okay. Oh, no, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Same as what I get from that. Yeah. I haven't been active on that account very much, but that's like my this kind of stuff account. The other one's like. <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm going to keep those worlds separate. <laughs> Any questions on anything we've covered today? A little early because demos were bad. Then we got the Okay. Well, I guess try just end the Zoom. Thank you.